شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Dear brothers and sisters um, The title of this talk is the, the uh, Ramadan of the Salaf The Ramadan of the Salaf, to be honest, uh, I think this is a very good topic um, And the idea is to go back in time And to see if we were living there in the first three generations How would the Muslims, the early Muslims, would spend their time in Ramadan And what we will find in this dars, inshallah is that there are basically five main things, five main areas which the early Muslims, they would modify and change during Ramadan. And I'll tell you them now, inshallah, we'll go through them one by one, bismillah. And these five things are mentioned by Ibn Rajul, um, and also the reports I'll bring are by Imam Al-Dahbi, Rahim Al-Ain, Siyur Adam al Number one, you find their behavior used to change towards the Qur'an in Ramadan. That's the first and foremost thing. <coughs> The second is regarding Qiyamul Layl, the night prayer. The third is regarding Sadaqah, becoming more charitable in Ramadan. And the fourth is um, avoiding indulging in overeating. Yeah, so overeating, that's another thing. And then the last was safeguarding their tongue from any type of um, idle speech, any type of lying or gossiping, backbiting. So safeguarding their tongue from all of these things. Now, I'm going to mention something in the beginning, and that is that, uh, you know, subhanAllah, when you uh, hear about the narrations of the Salaf, sometimes, you know, subhanAllah, you'll be amazed by the things you hear, but it may not affect you in the right way. What do I mean by that? Mathal, for example, which is said uh, about the Salaf, that they would fast nearly all of the time. Yeah, some of them, it is reported that they will fast the entire year. Yeah, the entire, this is more than the, the fast of Dawud alayhi salam, they would fast the entire year. And uh, you find a report, for example, Imam al-Dahbi brings about one of the Salaf, that his father was critically ill and he used to continue fast. Even on his deathbed, he was fasting and they said to him, break your fast. And he refused to break his fast. You think, subhanAllah, and is that even possible for someone to be that uh, religious, that subhanAllah, fast the whole year, even when he's dying, he's saying, I'm not going to break my fast. Yeah. Now here are some people, they, this affects them in a wrong way. What does that mean? It means that they listen to this, they think, you know what, subhanAllah, these people are amazing. Uh, me, I'm scum, I'm rubbish, I'm not going to be anything like this. And they go away demoralized by <laughs> the narrations of the Salaf. Is that true or not? And when you hear subhanAllah, some people used to stay the whole night praying Qiyamul Layl. You think, man, I don't remember the last time I even dreamt about praying Qiyamul Layl. <laughs> Let alone pray Qiyamul Layl the whole night. You think, subhanAllah, what, is, what am I? Yeah, compared to these people, and the opposite effect is there, a negative effect. And this is from Shaytan. Rather, a person should realize that we are going to speak about the best of all people and they are examples to us. What does it mean to be an example? It means that we look up to them, we don't just respect and love them, but we say, you know what, I want to be like this person. Yeah? Inshallah, I want to be like this person. I want to do what this person used to do because Allah and the Prophet have praised these people. The most direct and explicit praise of the Salaf came from the Prophet in a hadith in Sahih Bukhari where he said, Khayrul Nas Qarni. In Sahih Bukhari, he said that the best of people, Qarni, my generation. يلونهم, and then those that followed them. Who are those people? At Tabi'in. يلونهم, and then those that came after them, meaning the Atba' Tabi'in. So he identified for us three uh, groups of people. The first group is what? The companions, and he said they're the best of the best. Then the second is the tabi'in, and thereafter, those that came after them, atba'ab tabi'in, the third generation. What does it mean they are the best? Khayrun nas qarni. What does that mean they're the best? Best in what? What do you think? What does it mean the best in what? Piety? Only piety? What else? Best in anything else? Who said this? Behavior. Naam, ahsant. Yeah, this is the answer that they're the best in everything. Everything you can imagine in terms of their worship, in terms of their iman, in terms of their fahm. 
in terms of the understanding of Islam, as a group of people, there's no group of people that will come after them who will better understand Islam than them. And this makes this lesson very important. Because what we're going to learn is that, you know, if you want to know the best way to spend your Ramadan, then you know what you have to do? You need to find out what the best people did in Ramadan. Yes. And this, this applies to every part of Islam. You know, subhanAllah, sometimes people differ on the interpretation on certain parts of Islam. They have differences of opinion. And though in the time of the Salat there were differences of opinion, sometimes you need to know uh, which opinion is more valid than another opinion, which is closer to the truth. How can I find this out? In terms of the evidence in the Quran and the Sunnah, it is open to interpretation. There could be a number of interpretations. But which is the right interpretation? What do you need to do? You need to see how the best generation understood that. And the way you can see how they understood it is how they lived by that instruction. Yeah. So let me start with a quick uh, question to you all. When you think of Ramadan, what's the first thing that comes into your mind? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Fasting. Fasting, yes. What else? Anything else? Huh? Quran. Anything else? Taraweeh. Anything else? Nothing else? You know, when I was young in school, they talk about fasting. They say fasting is a time of patience and to learn how poor people feel. No? Shukur, no? Somebody's there. Yeah. All the things are there, but if I said to you, but what is the first thing or the main thing that used to come into the minds of the companions and the early Muslims, which one do you think is the first one? Huh? See? Not sure, isn't it? But if you could identify what it was, then you know what? You could correct your own perception of Ramadan to be in line with the best people. Yeah. And what we will find is that the number one thing for the Salaf when it came to Ramadan was not a siyam It wasn't Qiyam. It was Quran. La, it was Quran. This was the first and most important thing for them in Ramadan was the Quran. Okay, and subhanAllah, you know the proof of this is in the Qur'an itself. What do you think is the proof of this? That when you think of Ramadan, the first thing you think of is not fasting, but Qur'an. Where is this in the Qur'an? Anyone help you? Where are we talking about in the Qur'an? Where does it, where does it speak about Qur'an? Where does it speak about Ramadan in the Qur'an in the first place? <laughs> Naam, ahsant. The word Ramadan only mentioned once in the Qur'an. Do you know that? Yeah. Only once. And what is it associated with? شَهْرُ Ramadan الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 185, the month of Ramadan is the one in which the Qur'an was sent down. That's how Allah identified uh, Ramadan, a month in which the Qur'an is supposed to be celebrated. And that is why you find that the interpretation, one of the interpretations in Jawzi brings about what does it mean the Qur'an was sent down in Ramadan? He said, one of the views is that it began to be sent down to the Prophet ﷺ in the month of Ramadan. Yeah. There's another view as well, which is that from the, from the highest heaven, from the seventh heaven, from Bayt al-Ma'mur, it was sent down to the lowest heaven uh, in the month of Ramadan. Now, so in the Quran you find that... Uh, it is speaking about Ramadan, and the first thing he spoke about is not fasting, but is Ramadan. And from the Prophet as well, we find in the hadith in Sayyid Bukhari, that Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala an, what did he say? He said that Jibreel alayhi salam, yalqahu fi kulli laylatin min Ramadan fayudarisuhu al-Qur'an. He said that Jibreel alayhi salam would visit the Prophet salam every night of Ramadan. And Yudarisuhu al Quran. And he would, Yudarisuhu can be translated to mean study the Quran, but there's another hadith as well, another narration, Yu'ariduhu, which means that the Prophet would recite the Quran to him. And he would uh, listen to him and also tell him that this part of the Quran goes inside this surah, this verse becomes before this surah, and that verse becomes after this uh, verse. Because the Prophet used to re uh, re uh, receive the Quran piecemeal. Part of the Qur'an would come down at certain times and sometimes a whole surah wouldn't come down but a part of the surah would come down. So in order to check and be told which part of the Qur'an this 
verse or verses fall into, that was the job of Jibreel alayhi salam. Yeah, that was done in the month of Ramadan. So here, Ibn Rajab said, this hadith of Ibn Abbas, in which the Prophet is being told that he, uh, Jibreel visits him and he every night goes through the Quran with him, is a proof that a person should increase in his recitation of the Quran in the month of Ramadan. Yeah, this is the main proof from the Quran and Sunnah that the, the month of Ramadan is supposed to be month of uh, the Quran. You know, I miss something here. And that is, the early Muslims, they would do, make dua to Allah in order to witness Ramadan even before it came. Yeah. So it is reported from some of the early Muslims that, uh, and Ibn Rajab mentioned this, for a report of Ma'la ibn Fadl. Ma'la ibn Fadl from the Tabi'in, he said that the Salaf would make dua to Allah six months before Ramadan that they get to experience it. Yeah, they get to witness it. And subhanAllah, I was thinking about uh, Muhammad Ali, rahimahullah, he passed away today. And subhanAllah, just a few days before Ramadan. Yeah, it is the qadr of Allah that he will not get to witness Ramadan, subhanAllah. So even for us, we should make dua to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to witness Ramadan and to allow us to benefit from this Ramadan. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. But this is one narration of the Salaf that they would make dua six months before. Here, Shaykh Abdul Aziz al-Tarifi, he said that it is not reported from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi or the companions that they would make dua uh, in order to witness Ramadan. But from the Tabi'in, it is, it is there. Authentically, it is reported. Tayyip. And also, there is another narration of the Salaf as well that they would make a dua to Allah. Oh Allah, I'll deliver us to Ramadan and deliver Ramadan to us. وَتَسَلَّمْهُ مِنِّي مُتَقَبَّلًا And allow it to be accepted from us. Yeah? And so we should make this dua to Allah as well. O oh Allah, deliver us to Ramadan and deliver Ramadan to us and take it from us as something accepted. Yeah? Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Now, in regards to the Qur'an, this is the first of the five, uh, five matters that the Salaf would really focus on in Ramadan. We find here a number of narrations. First narration, Al-Dahbi brings of Al-Asad ibn Yazid. يَخْتِمُ الْقُرْآنَ فِي رَمَضَانِ فِي كُلِّ لَيْلَتَيْنِ This man called Asad, Al-Asad ibn Yazid, Al-Aswad ibn Yazid rather, he used to finish one Qur'an every two nights in Ramadan. And he used to sleep between Maghrib and Isha. And in Ramadan, outside of Ramadan, he used to finish one Qur'an every six days. Yeah, one Qur'an every six days. So let us think about this deeply. How long does it take to finish one Qur'an in two days? How many hours do you think it takes a day? How many hours do you think it takes to finish one Qur'an in, in two days? Okay, let's say, how long does it take to read one juz? Person who is proficient, maybe as health, how long does it take to read one juz? 20 minutes, yeah, 15 minutes, let's say 10 minutes. Let's say 10 minutes, yeah? 10 minutes, so 300 minutes, yeah? Finish the Qur'an. Yeah, 300 minutes to finish the whole Qur'an. How many hours is that then? Five uh, hours. About five. Yeah, five. Five, six hours. This is six hours, yeah? So a day, how many hours? Three hours a day. You know, when you break it down like that, it seems doable, isn't it? <laughs> you think, subhanAllah, this is unbelievable. One Qur'an every two days, yeah? Subhanallah, me, only one juz. Every day. One Ramadan is one Quran. But when you think about it, subhanAllah, it's doable. Yeah? More narrations. Sa'id ibn Jubair. Yaftab al Qur'ana fi kulli laylatayn. Sa'id ibn Jubair, he used to recite one entire Quran every two nights. Another narration about Imam Malik, rahimahullah. Ila dakhla Ramadan, when Ramadan would enter, he would leave hadith. He would leave the teaching of hadith and the majalis and the gatherings of hadith. And he used to focus on the recitation of the Quran from the Mus'haf. Another narration, Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik. Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik, يَخْتِمُ fi kulli thalathin. He used to finish the Quran every three days. And in Ramadan, altogether, he would finish 17 Qurans. He would recite the Quran 17 times. Another narration of Qatada, يَخْتِمُ Quran fi sab'a. Outside of Ramadan, Qatada used to finish one Qur'an every seven days. By the way, this was a habit of the companions. A friend of mine recently uh, in Saudi Arabia, he went to Saudi Arabia or Jordan, he found in a museum 
copies of an old Mus'haf. And the old Mus'haf was divided into seven volumes. Why? Because they would recite one Quran every seven days. Yeah, so this is one of the old Mus'ahib. And uh, from there you can see that they would recite the Quran every week. Yeah, a portion split over seven days to complete one Quran. So outside of Ramadan, Qatada used to recite one Quran every seven days. وَإِذَا جَاءَ Ramadan, And when Ramadan would come, he would finish it every three, i.e. three days. And then in the last ten, he would recite one Quran every single night. Yeah, one Quran every single night. Sufyan al-Thawri. Again, Sufyan al-Thawri, when Ramadan would enter, he would leave every single person and he would focus on the recitation of the Quran. Yeah. Now here, a number of questions. The first question is, number one, is this possible for us? Is it possible for us, brothers? What do you think? Is it possible? Maybe if you put your mind to it. Okay, if you put your mind to it. You know, uh, subhanAllah, I was sharing these narrations with a brother from Bristol and he said that there is a woman in his family, amongst his relatives, she finishes one Qur'an every two days in Ramadan. Right now, living with us in this country, there is at least one woman who recites one whole Qur'an in two days. I said, how does she do it? He said, she's a mother with children, family, but every moment she gets in the day, she opens the Qur'an and she starts reading she said it takes it. He, he said she spends around five hours a day with the Quran. Five hours a day with the Quran. Now, this means that Subhanallah, Wallahi Alaihim, it is possible for us, isn't it? It is possible, but we are failing. Yeah, we are failing to do this, and we should ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to really allow us to aspire to to do this, to accomplish this. Subhanallah, if one person did it, then he has done something that was being done in the first three generations. Yeah, and this would be amazing. Yeah, this would be amazing. We ask Allah for the tawfiq. To do something like this. This is the first question. Is it possible? No, it is possible. Yeah, but it is a case of himma, of desire, aspiration, and uh, to ask Allah to give you the tawfiq. Another question is, isn't there a prohibition regarding reciting the Quran in less than three days? <coughs> we know that the Prophet in a narration, he forbade reciting the entire Quran in less than three days. You know this, isn't it? However, Ibn Rajul, rahimahullah, he said, that this, there are exceptions to this. The first exception is times which are virtuous, like Ramadan. In times which are virtuous, like Ramadan, then a person can recite in less than three days. And this is why the narrations about the Salaf are regarding this. Moreover, he said, in virtuous places like Makkah and Mukarramah, person who doesn't live in Makkah, but he visits Makkah, then he can recite the Quran so much, even if he finishes in both three days, it is fine for him. Yeah. There's another question here. Isn't it better to recite little with contemplation versus a lot without contemplation? What do you think? Who's thought this question before that? Isn't it better to recite a little bit and think about it as opposed to reciting a lot and not thinking about it? Here, we found, I found us, Father Sheikh Abdul Aziz Al Tarifi, he has a very good answer to this question. Sheikh Abdul Aziz Al Tarifi, he said that first of all, it is agreed upon. That Ramadan comes, a person will increase in his recitation of Quran. Agreed upon. However, it is also known that the reason the Quran was revealed was not to be recited, but to be acted upon through contemplation. He brings the verse in the Quran in Surah Sa'd, verse number 29. ayatihi. A book full of blessings sent down to you in order that you, not that you recite it, but you, لِيَدَّبَّرُ You contemplate. And a person cannot contemplate over something he is rushing through. True or not? No. Come. This means that you should recite slowly. Now how do we reconcile between the two? He said, as for the person who doesn't know much about what the Qur'an is talking about, he has no idea what the Qur'an has been halal, what the Qur'an has been haram, what the Qur'an is saying you have to do, what the Qur'an is saying you cannot do, so on and so forth, then this person should not rush to the Qur'an with quick recitation. Rather, this person should slow down and <coughs> reflect over the verses because he has very little knowledge about what the Qur'an is. And for him to just rush to the Qur'an, even if he gets many rewards, he will be partly sinful because he is so close to the Qur'an but he doesn't know what's, what he's talking about. Yeah, if the Qur'an may be speaking against him, subhanAllah, and he's reading the Qur'an, he doesn't realize. As for the person who has some knowledge about the halal and the haram of the Qur'an, and also uh, the guidance of the Qur'an in general, then this person, it is okay for him to recite 
uh, in speed. They call this hadar. Yeah, recite the Quran in speed. They call this hadar type of recitation. It's very fast. And when I was in Egypt uh, in Ramadan, you see people, subhanAllah, reciting uh, one Quran every two days, uh, one Quran every three days. And uh, you see, the, they listen to them recite, it's like, subhanAllah, man, Speedy Gonzalez, so fast. And I, I, had, I had that someone, I said, this is, isn't this like um, disrespecting the Quran in reciting this fast? Uh, but it's, wallah, it seems that reciting this fast for a person who has knowledge of the Quran, inshallah, it is, it is permissible. Yeah, it is permissible, inshallah, maybe it is good for them as well. Wallah. Now, a deep question What is the link between Quran and fasting? Why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about Ramadan and Quran together? Why is it that Jibreel will come to the person in Ramadan to revise the Quran? Why is it that the Salaf would increase in the recitation of Quran in Ramadan? What is the link between fasting and Quran? What do you think? Feeding your soul. Feeding your soul, okay. Who else? What is the link? There must be a link, right? Why more Quran in Ramadan? Why? Because the Quran was set down in Laylatul Qadr. Okay. There's the proof as well there from the brother. Anyone else? No. No, there's more reward, but uh, subhanAllah, yani, more reward for any good deeds. So, any good deeds. So, you know, how comes they didn't, for example, make a point of going for Umrah in Ramadan? We don't find that the Salaf used to make a point of going for Umrah in Ramadan. Yeah, um, many good deeds. Yani, how comes they focused on Quran? Why Quran, especially Quran? Well, Alam, if you read uh, Surah Al Baqarah, Alif Lam Mim, Dalik Al Kitabu La Raiba Fi, Hudan Lil Muttaqin. Yeah, Allah said, Alif Lam Mim. There is no doubt about it in this book. There is no doubts in this book whatsoever. It is Hudan guidance for people who have taqwa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, later on in the surah, Ya ayu al-ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum usiyamu, kama kutiba ala al-ladheena min qablikum, la'allakum, la'allakum tattaqoon. Allah said, believers, fasting has been prescribed and you like it was on those before you, so that you may become people of taqwa. So the link, subhanAllah, is that if a person fasts with the right frame of mind, his a sense of taqwa will increase. When it increases, he will become more susceptible to the guidance of the Qur'an. Yeah? He will become more susceptible to the guidance of the Qur'an, and the Qur'an is guidance. And even in the ayah about Ramadan, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ هُدًا لِلنَّاسِ yeah? Allah said, the month of Ramadan in which the Qur'an was sent down, what is the Qur'an? It is a guide for people. Yeah? It is a guide for people. So we see that the connection between Qur'an and fasting is that of taqwa. Fasting increases taqwa and the Qur'an will give guidance to the muttaqi. Yeah? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those people. Ameen. Now, now, Qiyamul Layl, the second, uh, second aspect of the life of the Salaf that would change Ramadan was the Qiyamul Layl. We know that the early Muslims in general, they would pray Qiyamul Layl as a habit. Until some of them, like Al Hasan al Basri, said that if, we can't, if a person finds he misses Qiyamul Layl, he should look to the sins he did in the day. For the sins he did in the day have deprived him from praying Qiyamul Layl in the night. Yes, subhanAllah. However, we find that in Ramadan they would increase in this. Yeah, they would increase in this. By the way, you know, praying Qiyamul Layl is not easy. It's not easy for anyone. Yeah, and Hassan Basri is a narration here. Lam ajid shay'an min al ibadah ashadu min al salah fi jawfi layl. He said, I, talking about himself, I haven't found anything more difficult than praying in the middle of the night. Yeah, and they say jawfi layl, it means sleeping, then waking up and praying, as opposed to just getting two rakah just before you go to bed or just before Fajr comes in, wake up and pray two rakah. This is all good. But no, they're talking about sleeping and then <coughs> forcing yourself to wake up, alhamdulillah, and then praying Qiyamul Layl. Here we have a number of narrations that show us that the Salaf would increase in the Qiyamul Layl in Ramadan. First narration here is of Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala. He instructed Ubay ibn Ka'b 
who was one of the Qurra of the companions, one of the most well-read uh, in the recitation of the Qur'an was Ubay ibn Ka'b. And Tamim al-Dari, to lead the people in prayer during Ramadan, they would lead in the long suwar. He said, the al-mi'een. Al-mi'een means the suwar that whose verse is going to the hundreds. Yeah, al-Baqarah, al-Nisa, al-Imran, so on and so forth. Uh, and he said that uh, it would be so long that the people would have to rely on a staff to keep themselves standing. Yeah, they would have to get a stick to make sure they remain standing. And they would finish Qiyam al-Layl close to the time of Fajr. This is narrated in by Al-Bayhaqi. And they would finish Qiyam al-Layl by the time, just before Fajr is coming in. And I remember in Egypt there was a, a masjid notorious for long salah. Notorious. Until they pray Asr, half an hour long Asr, mashallah. Half an hour long. Isha. You can think of one hour maybe, Isha. And one of my friends said uh, he took a friend of his, a colleague, who wasn't that practicing to this masjid, <laughs> not by mistake, on purpose, for Asr Salah. And the brother, Allah, in sujood, you can imagine maybe four minute long sujood, five minute long sujood, something like this. He thought the Imam died. <laughs> so he raised his head from, from the sajda and he said, MashaAllah, Qad mat al Imam. The Imam passed away in, in sajda. But no one raised their head, he realized that. He realized that he, he's in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyhow, just to show you that there are people yani, still amongst us, mashallah, they take their salah very seriously. There's another narration, the son of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Abdullah. He heard his father, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, say that we would finish our qiyam and hurry to eat our food out of faith that Fajr would begin. Yeah? That this is how long they used to pray Qiyamul Layl. It would come up right to the time of Fajr and they would fear that, you know what, the time is going to finish now, we need to go and eat quickly. This is reported by Imam Malik in his Muatta. What does this mean for us? What this means for us is that a person prays Taraweeh, Alhamdulillah, good. Yeah. If he has the ability to pray more, then he should pray more by himself. This is what we are learning here. Here a person needs to evaluate himself. Because it is the case that some people, mashallah, they like to pray taraweeh and they get so tired they miss the fajr in jama'ah. True or not? What is better? Fajr in jama'ah or taraweeh? Wallahi, a lifetime of taraweeh doesn't equate to one fajr in jama'ah. Yeah? If the sunnah of fajr, the Prophet said, is better than this dunya and everything inside it, what then about the fajr itself? <laughs> yeah? So a person needs to evaluate themselves. These narrations should inspire you but you need to sabrun jameel, take things slowly. Yeah? Build yourself up to be a person who can do the ibadah and prioritize. Nothing is better than the fara'id. Nothing. But from the nawafil, if you have the fara'id, mashallah, you are a person who is adhering to the fara'id, then he should look to the nawafil. And when it comes to the nawafil, he should set himself a target. The target of the salaf is that they would spend most of the time on the night in Qiyamul Layl. There's another narration here from, from Nafi' عن عبد الله بن عمر The son of Umar al-Khattab Abdullah أنه كان يقوم في بيته في شهر رمضان فإذا صرف الناس من المسجد أخذ إداوة من, من ماء That Ibn Umar that he used to wait in his house in Ramadan and praying and when the people had left the masjid he would take his إداوة his uh, leather pouch of water يخرج إلى المسجد. Then he would go to the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. ثم لا يخرج منه and he would not exit from it until he had prayed the Fajr salah. Yeah, until he had prayed the Fajr salah. In terms of how much they would recite in the Qiyamul Layl when they would pray together, there's a narration of Abu Ashab. Abu Ashab قال كان أبو رجاء يختم بنا في قيام رمضان لكل عشرة أيام. In this narration, it is said that a man called Abu Raja would lead the Muslims in prayer and every 10 days he would finish one Quran. Yeah, so now Taraweeh, we read one juz every day. Yeah, so imagine they were we were trying to finish not the Quran in 30 days but in 10 days. How long would the Taraweeh prayer be? Maybe three hours. Yeah, maybe after three hours. And again, remember in, uh, in Egypt, in Ramadan, in the last from the from the 15th day onwards, they would start Qiyamul Layl and they would try to finish two Qurans in Qiyamul Layl. 
So basically, you used to get overlap between Taraweeh recitation and the Qiyamul Layl, the Quran, uh, yani coming to the same place. And uh, the Qiyamul Layl, MashaAllah, there, two, two hours, two and a half hours. And I remember, SubhanAllah, praying next to a brother, had one leg. Yeah, he had one leg. And for part of the standing, he would put his, his uh, crutch to one side and he would just stand just like this with one leg. I think, SubhanAllah, I you, man. And then only when he'd go into Ruku, he would take it to rest on it. I think, SubhanAllah, how can we ever make excuse for ourselves when this man doesn't make excuse for himself? Yeah, I think, SubhanAllah. Now, in terms of you know, practical help, how to pray Qiyamul Layl and balance the sleep? Some of us are going to work in the day. Some of us are studying, so on and so forth. How is it possible that a person can have such a little amount of sleep and still, you know, function? Yeah, still function. Here we see that uh, there are some studies that are done even in our times regarding how how little sleep is enough for a human being to function. So there is this theory called uh, polyphasic sleep. Polyphasic sleep. Recently, there was a PhD student from uh, Oxford. <coughs> I was going to say Al Medina. <laughs> <laughs> from Oxford, he uh, himself he did experiment on himself, where he slept only for four and a half hours a day. Yeah, four and a half hours a day. And the way he did it, he said that uh, in the night time he would sleep for three hours, you know, three and a half hours, and then he would take three naps, three twenty minutes naps in the day. And he said that he was able to do that for at least two years. Yeah, at least two years and function and do his PhD at the same time. So he said that there's a science behind it. They said sleep happens in three stages, the first, second, and the last, which is the REM, the REM, the repetitive eye movement, which is the part where you dream. And a person goes into that stage of sleep at around 90 minutes. Yeah. So he said that after 90 minutes, when you go into that stage, it starts again. Yeah, early sleep, middle sleep, deep sleep. He said that if you set your alarm for three to three and a half hours, you'll find that you wake up in between the cycles. So I said, when you wake up, you don't feel like you're dying. You feel refreshed. Yeah. And then he said there's something called uh, sleep pressure. Sleep pressure builds over the day and it can be released by naps. And he gave a time for a 20 minute nap. Yeah. So this is a tip. For you to try in this Ramadan to try to maximize the time that you can spend in Qiyamul Layl. Now, it does depend what uh, calendar you're following, Taran. 18 degrees or <laughs> the other calendar. Uh, inshallah, whichever the case, if you're following the, the later time, there's more, there's more time for Qiyamul Layl for you. Then uh, you can try this. Don't go to sleep after the Suhoor, go to sleep for three and a half hours, wake up, and then maybe. In the lunchtime at work, had taken a nap because uh, you're not doing anything else, <laughs> not eating. And thereafter, when you come home, take another nap. Khala, see whether you can do it. Yeah. At the end of the day, for Allah says that fear Allah as much as you can. Try and push yourself. Yeah. Push yourself to the maximum. There are ways. We're finding that people, Subhanallah, for dunya, can go for four and a half hours sleep. Why not for the akhirah for us? Isn't it? Subhanallah. This is the way we should think about it. Imam Ghazali Rahimah also mentioned a number of things to help a person stay up at night and not miss Qiyam al-Layl. Of them, he said, don't eat too much before you sleep. Sounds very simple advice, but for many of us, it's very difficult to do that. <laughs> when it comes to the iftar, khalas, everyone jumps on the table. Uh, and the, he also mentioned taking naps, and he also said not to exhaust yourself during the day, uh, so that when you come to the night, you sleep heavy. So this is the first two things, the Qur'an and then the uh, Qiyam al-Layl. Who can remind me of what are the other three? Who is paying attention? What are the other three? Sadaqa and? Yes, overeating and? And said Gantam, Ahsan. When it comes to Sadaqa, we find that the proof that a person should increase in being charitable comes from the Prophet himself in a hadith in Sayyid Bukhari, Ibn Abbas, can be Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ajwad al nas that the Prophet ﷺ was the most generous of all people. You have to appreciate that, you know. <clears throat> Being generous is more difficult when everyone knows who you are, isn't it? <laughs> when everyone knows who you are and will approach you, it's more difficult to be generous. Because so many people will come to you with needs, how are you going to fulfill everyone's <coughs> needs? Yeah? 
as opposed to someone who doesn't know, no one knows who you are, you can choose when to be generous. Yeah? Prophet ﷺ, everyone knew who he was. Everyone would come to him. Despite that, Ajwad al-Nas, he was the most generous of people. وَأَجْوَدُ مَا يَكُونُ فِي رَمَضَانِ And he would become even more generous in the month of Ramadan. And then he said, أَجْوَدُ بِالْخَيْرِ مِنَ الْرِيحِ الْمُرْسَلَ Until he became like the blowing wind. Yeah, The blowing wind means that as it gushes, yeah, in the same way the Prophet ﷺ would be so generous. Yeah, He would just give and give and give. Here we find a number of narrations as well that the early Muslims would follow in suit of the Prophet ﷺ. Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala, it said uh, he would only ever break his fast with the poor people. And when his family would say to him, why don't you break fast with us? He would, he would reprimand them for that. Yeah, he would reprimand them for that. Another narration of Ibn Shihab, Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri. When Ramadan would come, he would busy himself in only two things. Number one, the Qur'an. And number two, the feeding of poor people. There's another narration here of Hamad. Of Hamad. وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ يُفَطِّرْ فِي شَهْرِ رَمَضَانِ خَمْسَ insan. That Hamad would break the fast of 500 people in Ramadan. Yeah, 500 people in Ramadan. So here, subhanAllah, uh, my brothers and sisters, person should plan on how they're going to be generous in Ramadan. Generosity is shown in a number of ways. Yeah. Here we find uh, from generosity is to feed the person who is fasting. Whether the person is poor or not, you should offer to break a fast on another person by someone, a meal, or many people. Or in the masjid, for example, where you find that they are hosting the iftar for the people, you should come forward and say, you know what, I will provide the food for one day. Yeah? Or maybe more than this. Um, also, generosity towards the family. Yeah? Generosity towards your parents, buying them gifts. And of course, the poor and needy. And the best way to do this, Wallah is that every single day of Ramadan, every single day, have a way of giving some sadaqah online. Even if it is little, as you know, the Prophet said that the best deeds are the ones are those that are done frequently, with consistency. Wa in aqal, even if they are little. So every day of Ramadan, plan. Uh, maybe subhanAllah you could even set up a direct debit of this nature which takes some money out of your account every single day of Ramadan and gives it to some charitable cause Inshallah, may Allah make us some people who become generous in Ramadan Then the last two The last two is not overindulging in food This is mushkila for many people Yeah, mushkila For many people You know, the whole day of Ramadan is spent thinking about food What then when the time of food comes? And then when the time of food comes, you're not thinking about food and looking for food. Food it becomes looking at you. <laughs> the food starts looking at you by the time it's time to break your fast. However, here we find that the early Muslims, that they would, they would not overindulge in food. Why do you think they wouldn't overindulge in food? Why? Huh? Tarawih will become a problem. No, exactly. That they were looking forward to Qiyam al And then we all know one too many samosa and then Qiyam al becomes difficult, isn't it? Yeah, Qiyam al becomes difficult. So the, there's a narration here, subhanAllah, of Ibrahim ibn Abi Ayyub. Ibrahim ibn Abi Ayyub. He would only have two full meals during the whole of Ramadan. In the whole of Ramadan, the only time he would have a full meal was twice. Yeah, twice. And again, the, the wisdom is there because they didn't want to, to jeopardize their Qiyam al the last is cautiousness in speech, safeguarding their tongues from speaking a lot and of course from saying anything which is haram like lying, backbiting, so on and so forth. What is the proof of this? That in Ramadan you should be extra careful that you don't run your mouth, start talking about other people's business, lying about someone, having foul mouth, so on and so forth. What is the proof of this? That in Ramadan, you know what? Extra careful about your tongue. Anyone know? No. No, Ahsan, very good. There is a hadith in Sahih al Bukhari. The Prophet said that Man lam yada qawla zur wal amada bihi falaysa lillahi haja fi a. He said that if a person cannot be bothered to avoid qawla zur, which means speech which is crooked. Crooked meaning speech that is like entails lying, uh, being foul mouthed, backbiting, so on and so forth, and acting in that way too, then Allah has no need of that type of fasting. Yeah, Allah has no need that He avoids food and drink. What does this mean? 
doesn't mean that a brother says to himself, you know what, I, I'm not going to stop backbiting other people, I might as well stop fasting. Some, can someone interpret it in this way? But what's the point, Yani? Khalas, I just, person, my tongue, I just always talk and think, second. Yeah, what's the point of me fasting? Look, here they said, Ibn, Ibn Battal, for example, he explained the hadith as not being a ruling, but rather being a warning. What is the difference? What is the difference between a warning and a ruling? What does that mean? It means that it is not if you do engage in foul type of speech, your siyam is null and void. Rather, it is a warning. If you do this, then your reward will diminish. diminish. And you, you will risk the acceptance of your siyam from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you risk displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and incurring his wrath upon you as well. This is the advice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this, subhanAllah, it teaches us a deep lesson. That is, fasting Ramadan is given to us for a higher objective. The higher objective is to attain taqwa. What is taqwa? It is to the ability to hold back on sin. What does that mean? It means the person is impulsive. Whatever he wants to do, he goes and does it. He doesn't think twice. Rather, a person of taqwa, he holds back on his impulse, he thinks about Allah first. This is what it means. Yeah? And thereby, he saves himself from Jahannam. How does fasting do this to a person? Well, if a person is always having to think twice about eating and drinking, then he will think twice about doing haram. And then on top of that, Allah made it something we do every single day because practice makes perfect. So Ramadan is a training for us in order to become people who hold back on impulse and have taqwa. That is why the Prophet is saying that if you, if you can't stop yourself from you know, talking in a way which is bad, acting in a way that is bad, even if you don't eat and drink, you know what, you're missing the point. You're missing the point of fasting. The whole idea is not to be hungry, but to be a person of taqwa. Yeah. So this is uh, the lesson from the Prophet and we find here a number of narrations from the Salaf is from Mujahid ibn Jabr. Mujahid, the famous student of Ibn Abbas, he said that there are two things. Whoever guards them, whoever guards themselves from them, will have his fast accepted. Number one, al-ghibah. Number two, al kari Whoever guards himself from backbiting and lying, then he will find that his fast is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, now, inshallah, this is uh, some of the narrations of the Salaf regarding the Ramadan and how it would be if you were there with them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, inspire us to, to live up to our, our models, our role models. Yeah? And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make some of those who read the Quran you know, passionately during Ramadan. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make some of those who are more generous than Ramadan, who spend less time sleeping and more time praying. And also of those who, who hold back on speaking uh, without thinking. And also of those that uh, are charitable with our families, relatives and poor. Ameen ya rabbal alameen. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabi Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahbihi ajma'in. Barakla fikum wa jazakum la khayl. I don't know if we have time for questions or not. Yeah? How long? Five minutes. What about sisters? Can you ask questions? Um, How will they ask? They will not take their relatives. Okay, yeah. so if you have a uh, male relative here, sisters, you can text it, inshallah. Uh, we will try to answer. Any questions, others? If you want to add something, you can add, inshallah. No, oh, sure. Okay. Uh, the question about tarawih, is The brother asked a question regarding uh, tarawih. Is it possible, is it permissible rather, to hold the mushaf in your hand whilst uh, praying, praying tarawih? This is reported from Aisha radiallahu uh, anha. She would tell her servants to hold the mushaf uh, whilst they would uh, lead the Qiyamul Layl or when they would pray Qiyamul Layl. So here we say that what does this narration teach us? It teaches us that in the Nawafil Salah, in the voluntary prayers, it is permissible for a person to hold the mushaf in order to recite from it. As for the, as for the Faraid, it is not possible even to read from it. Yeah, never mind holy, it's not possible to even read from it. Allah. Yeah. So we find this in, in some of the Middle Eastern countries that in Ramadan you find that there's a stand there with a the mushaf on it. 
because sometimes the Imam hasn't made hifz of Quran, so he has a mushaf there and he is reciting and he turns a page uh, as he leads the people in prayer. Inshallah, there's nothing wrong with this. Yes, sir, the back there. Okay, the brother asked the question, how many units of, of Qiyam al-Layl would they pray uh, when they would pray by themselves or when they pray together? There is a narration about Umar al-Khattab that they would, he would instruct them to pray 20 raka'ah. There's a narration of that. There's also narrations about them praying privately that some would pray uh, 11, which means with the witr, and some would pray uh, 13. Yeah, some would pray 13. So... But the, the masala of the number of units of Qiyam al-Layl is that it is open, it is not restricted, yeah? it is not confined to a certain number. And the Prophet told a person who asked about Qiyam al-Layl, Mathna, Mathna, two by two, and if you fear Fajr coming in, you can pray with it as one. So he instructed a man who's asking about how to pray Qiyam al-Layl by telling him, pray as many as you can, just as long as you do them in twos. Even if you pray all the way to Fajr, then if you find that Fajr is coming in and you're running out of time, pray just one. So in terms of the actual number, it is not an issue. It is not an issue. Yeah. So some even narrations in the Madhu Imam Malik, 40. Yeah, 40 rakat rawi. It is there. Why? Because the masala is open. Yeah. So inshallah, the main thing is to 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 pray uh, as many as possible. Yeah. Allah. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. The extension from the brother's question from the Musaf, does that extend to mobile phones? Yeah, the mobile phone is maybe if you have to put it in airplane mode. Otherwise, khalas, WhatsApp, Skype, and everything is playing at the same time. Mushkila. Yeah, the Musaf, yani Musaf, in any form. Yeah, in any form. Uh, the Musaf on the phone is your use. There's no problem with that. Musaf of the, the print one. But I think with the phone, the only mushkila is that. If uh, other things start appearing on the screen, yeah, then then it'll be a mushkila, you know. So popular people can have problems. Yes. You know, um, Ramadan, you know, becoming close to exam um, time for many students. Yes. Know, for these students, it's there. Yeah. So, what advice um, would you give to students, you know, who will, you know, who find themselves in a situation where they have to balance out, you know, preparing for exams and reading, and obviously then Ramadan as well. Um, yes. Now, the brother asked a question about exams in Ramadan. People having GCSEs, I don't know if there's other exams still happening now. It's not time. How do they, you know, balance the equation? They've got uh, fasting and then revision of the exams, so on and so forth. Uh, good question. You know, it's very hard. Is it possible to get there? First of all, there's a number of uh, false assumptions regarding fasting and studying. And it is being pushed more and more in schools by non-Muslims. And that is that fasting is detrimental to your study and also detrimental to your health. Therefore, children should not fast. Have you heard this? It's true, isn't it? It's being said more and more until one brother showed me a letter from the school telling the parents that they better watch out if they tell their children to fast because we say that they shouldn't fast. Imagine that the school is interfering with the way we practice our Islam and the way we raise our children on Islam subhanAllah. And it has gone to that level. So on this point, we say that there is a number of misconceptions here, false assumptions. First assumption is fasting is detrimental to your study. Yeah? We say, what is the proof of this? Who said that in the first place? What we see is there are a number of subhanAllah. Uh, first of all, you know this um, Peter Osborne, the guy in charge of the finance of this country, he fasts two days a week, five to day. Well, the guy is in charge of the money of this country, and you're saying fasting is bad. Well, go and tell him that fasting is bad. It is not bad, there's no proof for this, yeah, that it affects your, uh, it is detrimental to your studying. On top of this, we find that a number of high profile athletes in America, basketball players, uh, I believe in the Olympics as well, in the last Olympics, football players, and so on and so forth, they fast and they play their game, yeah. And they themselves say that, you know what, it didn't affect me negatively. Some of them even say, it helped me positively. Yeah, so this is an assumption. And a person should not start to think about their fasting based on this assumption, because this is a false assumption. There's no proof of that. Uh, in terms of uh, the time factor, 
what we find is that you have more time to study because there's less time and if time has become free because you're not thinking about lunch and dinner and so on and so forth yeah uh, so my, my advice is that first of all just honey push yourself yeah push yourself and just realize that many generations will come before you they used to fast and do their exams okay let's not make a big deal of it now yeah because even I remember my parents found that because uh, the last time Ramadan was in the summer uh, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago or something like this. Uh, and we find that people used to fast. It's no deal. Maybe in the first few days it's a deal, big deal. But after that, khalas, it becomes like a habit. Yeah, it becomes like a habit. So if anything, it should help the person because it gives them more time. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure this is. In terms of that, and stuff like that, you have a Uh huh. Yes, yes. This is why I, I, I gave the tips regarding sleep. Yeah, the person should be able to push themselves to sleep less. How? I gave, some, I gave a tip there, that try that you reduce your sleep and uh, increase your naps. Yeah, it is possible, which is doable, there's even a science behind it. A person should try these things. Yeah, a person should try these things. And another false assumption is that a person has to fast even if uh, it becomes something which is harmful for him. It is, sometimes it's a case that a person may become ill uh, or, or is ill and his recovery will become prolonged from fasting. This is already recognized by the Sharia. Yeah. Allah already said this in the Quran. If you're ill or you're going to have your illness prolonged because of fasting, then you can make it up afterwards. Yeah. So if a person is fasting and becomes ill, he's not stuck. Rather he can break the fast. Yeah, and he can make it up afterwards. Allah. So inshallah I think that perhaps we're making a big bigger deal of it than it is. A person should try as much as possible to work on Allah. Yeah, to work on Allah, inshaAllah. Sorry, just, uh, is anyone else? Yes, I'll come to you, inshaAllah. MashaAllah, mm -hmm. Yes. Now, the brothers asked the question about the sister who is pregnant, um, whether or not she should fast or not. This is a fiqhi masala. You have a dars in fiqh, inshallah. You can ask the sheikh uh, in that dars, inshallah. Yes? Um, in regards to the balance, um, and which takes precedence over reciting or trying to memorize the Quran? Okay, brother asked the question which takes precedence to the qira'a, tilaw al Quran, to recite the Quran or to memorize the Quran? Here we say that it's clear from the Salaf that their uh, priority was on recitation and recitation, increase in recitation until they were reciting one Quran every two days. This is well known, this is agreed upon, this is what a person should try to do. However, it is also good to start to memorize some of the Quran during Ramadan. Let us not kid ourselves, there are very few people that memorize Quran. Very few people that memorize Quran. Yeah. So, month of Shah Ramadan, Shah of Quran, a person should try to start to memorize Quran. I remember once. Uh, this is about four years ago in Atika. A brother, MashaAllah, he started to memorize Surah Baqarah in Atika. And then, uh, this was, I think this one was this, uh, I think it was like end of August. This was Atika, yeah, Ramadan, end of August. And then in uh, March or April, he WhatsApp me and he said, I just finished. And he said, I just finished Al Baqarah. So after about four or five months, he managed to clock the whole of Surah Baqarah. So this is from the barakah of the of Ramadan. So it is a good idea to set yourself a target to memorize something of the Quran. I would suggest you select a surah which is challenging for you. A person who doesn't read much Quran, or something from Juz'am, a person who does, mashallah, then something from the middle, and a person who is well-versed, he should try to complete his hibz or to continue to memorize something uh, longer than this. Khalas, I think... They finish it? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
um, because you know in your local masjid you know many people they distract you and you start talking salam and kalam all these things yeah, that happen um, Ya yeah, Allah it's a good idea and we had this narration from Sufyan Athori that he would uh, basically disconnect himself <laughs> from the people yeah and subhanAllah maybe we can link this subhanAllah with social media yeah maybe Allah in Ramadan it's a good idea to disconnect yourself from social media because this is even more damaging than coming to the masjid and just talking to people and losing your time because uh, you know subhanAllah Last year, I came across a research done by UK Gov poll, and they said that in the UK, average person, uh, the average time a person spend in front of a screen, be that a smartphone, iPad, or computer, is eight hours and forty-four minutes a day. This is outside of working time. Outside of working time, average person is spending eight hours and forty-four minutes a day. What is even more funnier than this is the average time spent sleeping is 8 hours and 22 minutes. So people spend more time in front of their phones than they do in the bed. And then we complain, how am I going to recite one Quran every two days? How am I going to have time to make dhikr of Allah during the morning and evening? How am I going to get time to pray qiyamul layl, sleep problem, mushkila, all of these things? And we're wasting our time. Wasting our time in front of our phones on social media and so on and so forth. The person in Ramadan definitely uh, should avoid places where he will waste his time. Uh, if that means going to the masjid, as long as the person is able to make sure he prays his salah in the other masjid, then go for it. And moreover, the person should think twice about you know continuing their social media habits during Ramadan. Wallah.